Christian Spirituality in the Catholic Tradition, Part 3 Christian Gnosticism Because of the excesses to which it led, Gnosticism is generally condemned outright as an attempt to Hellenize Christianity by adapting the gospel to Greek philosophy. This was not so from the beginning, however, for the first phase of Gnosticism was simply an effort to express, in philosophical terms, the moral and doctrinal content of sacred scripture. It is only later, towards the end of the second century, that some Gnostics promulgated the doctrine of the dual principle of creation and the erroneous conclusions that follow from such a doctrine. Thus, according to Boyer, Gnosticism was not originally a heterodox idea, either in Christianity or in Judaism. The Alexandrian Christians did not need to introduce it into Orthodox Christianity, for the simple reason that it had always had an important place in it. Even with these Christians, even with Clement, the Christian theologian doubtless most infatuated with Greek philosophy, Gnosis, was never defined in the combination of Christianity and philosophy, as Clement says. Gnostic is the knowledge of the name and the understanding of the gospel. As a matter of fact, DuPont concludes that the meaning of Gnosis, as used by St. Paul, owes nothing to Greek philosophy and that even in later Hellenism, such as in Philo's works, Gnosis refers to knowledge of God only as a result of the Greek Bibles. In St. Paul, therefore, Gnosis signified the knowledge of God, knowledge of the mystery or secrets of God, and the understanding of the mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, 4 through 9. In St. John, Gnosis is united with love and takes on mystical qualities. Reflections of the Pauline and Johannine doctrine are found in the DDK, in the Shepherd of Hermias, Hermias and in the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, but it is in Clement of Rome that the pseudo-Barnabas, that the doctrine of Gnosis is clearly set forth. Then, when heretical Gnosticism begins to flourish, St. John and St. Irenaeus defended the Christian Gnosis against pseudo-Gnosis. It has been said of St. Irenaeus that he destroyed Gnosticism and introduced Orthodox Christian theology. St. Justin's first defense of the Christian doctrine was published around the year 150. His second defense appears in 155. His dialogue with Trypho around the year 160. According to St. Justin, Christianity is the one true and universal religion because the truth is manifested in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, the ancient religions and even the Greek philosophers possess the seed of truth, and to the extent that they do, they are partakers of Christ, the Word. Therefore, the teachings of the Greek philosophers are not entirely contrary to Christian truth and need not be rejected in toto. But St. Justin insists that the natural reason alone is not sufficient for attaining salvation or the complete truth. One also needs interior grace and external revelation. Accordingly, although St. Justin and the other Christian apologist tried to express the Christian truth in philosophical languages, they were not philosophers primarily, but Christian theologians, defending and explaining the truth of revelation by reason. Revelation of the truths in acceptance 
Of that truth, through faith, were always the starting point of their philosophizing. As a witness to the faith and teachings of the Church, St. Justin speaks with great authority, and this is especially true of his description of the Eucharistic liturgy. He was one of the first apologists to divulge the secret of the liturgy, which up to that time was carefully concealed from the pagans. On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss of peace. There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. As he takes them, giving praise and glory to the Father of the universe, through the name of the Son of the Holy Spirit, and offers thanks at considerable length for our being accounted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers and almsgiving, all the people present express their assent by saying Amen. And when the President has confected the Eucharist, and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons to give each of those presents a partake of the bread and wine mixed with water, over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and for those who are absent they carry away a portion. And this food is called among us the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the person who believes that the things which we teach are true, and who has been washed with the washing, that is, for the remission of sins, unto regeneration, and who is living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. And so likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who, may, who was made flesh. Four apostles, in the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, Do this, ye, in remembrance of me, this is my body, and that, after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he says, This is my blood, and he gave it to them alone. Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. The second outstanding defender of Christian doctrine against the heterodox Gnostics was St. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons who probably suffered martyrdom in 202. In his monumental work against heresies, St. Irenaeus refuted the errors of Marcion, who taught a heretical dualism and denied the humanity of Christ. After demonstrating that Marcion's Gnosticism must necessarily lead either to dualism or pantheism, St. Irenaeus presents a synthesis of orthodox spiritual theology. Like St. Justin, he rested on his, his case on the deposit of faith as found in Scripture, 
and handed down by apostolic tradition. The only true and life-giving faith the Church has received from the apostles and imparted to the faithful. For the Lord to give, uh, the Lord of all gave to his apostles the power of the gospel, through whom we also have known the truth, that is, the doctrine of the Son of God, to whom also the Lord has declared, He who hears you, hears me. The church is the church of God. Where the church is, there is the Spirit of God. While Tertullian was defending the synthesis composed by St. Irenaeus, sometimes almost too zealously, Clement of Alexandria and his disciple Origen were expounding a truly Christian Gnosticism at the school of Alexandria. For Clement, the Christian life is composed of stages through which the individual passes to the state of perfection. The various stages are called mansions of the soul. The mansions are classified as holy fear, faith and hope, and finally charity. Actually, not all so souls reach the final stage, and therefore Christians are divided into those of ordinary faith and those who are true Gnostics, perfect faith. The Gnostic or perfect Christian is characterized by contemplation, obedience to the precepts, and the instruction of good men. Contemplation, of course, is for St. Clement on the summit of Gnosis, which consists in knowing God, seeing God, and possessing God. Therefore, Gnosis is closely related to prayer, which says to St. Clement, tends to become interior, silent, and constant, and to charity, in which the Gnosis becomes firmly established. God is love, says St. Clement, and he, know, he is knowable to those who love him. The final state of Christian Gnosis is apatheia, which is the result of complete control of the passions and desires as well as detachments from created things. It is the peace and unity that flows from charity. Origen severely ascetical in his personal life and hailed as the first scientific exegete in the church and the first to produce a systematic manual of dogmatic theology was placed in charge of the school of alexandria in 203 at the age of 18. in his treatise on prayer which had a profound influence on later monastic spirituality he teaches a mysticism that reaches the Trinity through Christ. Though he speaks of Gnosis, as did Clement, the treatment is not the same, as Boyer points out. The greatest difference between the two Gnosis is that Clement so easily turns back on itself in order to understand itself, to describe itself and perhaps to savor itself. Origen, on the contrary, hardly describes itself at all. Wholly taken up as is with the unique object, the mystery of Christ, contemplated in the scriptures, it was in this way, probably, that Origen exercised the deepest and most enduring influence on all later Christian spirituality. Perfection, says Origen, consists in becoming as much like God as possible, and in order to do this, the soul must progressively detach itself from this world and gain mastery over its desires and passions. To achieve this, the soul must acquire a knowledge of self by means of examination of conscience and must also imitate the life of Christ. However, Origen agrees with St. Clement in stating that only the perfect attain to Gnosis. The multitudes do not. Once the soul has passed from the state of a beginner to an advanced state, 
Its spiritual combat is no longer with itself, but against the devil. But when the soul approaches the state of the perfect, it enjoys various types of visions, and the wisdom or gnosis that constitutes the mysticism of the Logos. At this point, participation in the mystery of Christ terminates in the Trinity and in the mystical marriage. In this state, says Origen, the soul is divinized in what it contemplates, and it is raised to friendship with God and to communion with him by participating in the divinity. By the third century there were communities of Christians in France, Lyons, Vienne, Marseille, Arles, Toulouse, Paris, and Bordeaux. In Spain, Lyon, Merida, and Zaragoza. And in Germany, Cologne, Trier, Metz, Mainz, and Strasbourg. Carthage was the center of Christianity in North Africa, and in Egypt the focal point was at Alexandria. Beyond Europe and the countries of Northern Africa, Christianity had spread to Asia Minor, Armenia, Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, Arabia, and perhaps to India. This does not mean that the expansion of Christianity was peaceful and unimpeded. On the contrary, it encountered serious obstacles because of occasional doctrinal disputes from within and because of periodic persecutions by Roman authority. With the conversion of Constantine, Christianity was accepted as a legitimate religion, and during the reign of Theodosius, the first, three seven nine to three ninety five. It became the official religion of the empire. Meanwhile, under Pope Damasus, who governed the church from three sixty six to three eighty four, the monastic movement spread quickly to Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor. At the same time, the life of Anthony the Hermit by St. Athanasius was a major factor in the rise of monasticism in Italy and France. Chapter 3 Monasticism in the East Monasticism began towards the end of the third century as the result of the efforts of ascetical Christians to live a more perfect life. Although it would eventually constitute a distinct state of life in the church, at the beginning it was the manner of life available to any Christian who wanted to give an authentic witness to the teachings of Christ. The monastic movement began so quietly that historians are unable to describe its origin with exactitude and it was not until the 1930s that there was any serious investigation into the matter. However, there seems to be some connection between the end of the persecution of the Church and the flourishing of asceticism that was a prelude to the monastic movement. Thus, according to Fenelon, the persecution made less sol solitaries than did the peace and triumph of the church. The Christians, simple and opposed to any softness, were more fearful of a peace that might be gratifying to the senses than they had been of the cruelty of tyrants. Christian Virgins and Ascetics In the early days of the church, the supreme witness to Christ was martyrdom, although those who live in those times were ascetics and also men and women who vowed to live a celibate life. When the persecutions ended, the ascetics and the celibates were placed in a difficult situation. In a word that was tolerant of Christians, it was almost inevitable that relaxation should set in and that some Christians they should, should become worldly. 
As long as they were considered enemies of the state, it was relatively easy to avoid contact with a pagan society and to practice their religion within the confines of the small Christian communities, and if they were arrested, they could hope for the coveted crown of martyrdom. But once Christians obtained their freedom and, and Christianity became the official religion, it is no longer the pagan world that fights and eliminates the martyr. It is the hermit that takes up the attack and eliminates eliminates the world from his being. From the beginning of the second century there are references to ascetics who lived a life of continence, and it seems that the state of virginity was approved by the church and held in reverence by the faithful. Both Clement of Rome and St. Ignatius of Antioch speak of Christian men and women who had embraced a celibate life, and for both of these authors the primary purpose of the, cel of the celibate life is to imitate Christ in that respect. There are numerous texts from the third century that describe the role of virgins and other celibates in the life of the church. The treatises by Tertullian and St. Cyprian are especially noteworthy. Finally, in the 4th century, the authors who praised virginity were even more numerous. St. Athanasius, St. Basil, St. Gregory Nazianzen, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and Cassian. At the start of ascetics, Virgins and other celibates remained in their own homes, living with their families and sharing the common life of the local church. Sometimes they organized themselves into groups, similar to confraternities or chapters of a third order. Eventually, a rule of life was composed and promulgated by various authors such as St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, and St. Caesarius of Arles. Moreover, in, or, in order to be approved by ecclesiastical authority, men and women desirous of consecrating themselves to God in celibacy could make a vow to the effect into the hands of the bishop. Thus, as early as 306, the Council of Elvira in Spain imposed sanctions on virgins and who had been unfaithful to their consecration to God and their vow of virginity. At the same time, the Council of Ansira, 314, declared that consecrated virgins who marry were guilty of bigamy, since they were espoused to Christ. In 364, the civil law, under Valens, declared that anyone who married a consecrated virgin was subject to the death penalty. According to the canonical legislation, virgins were required to wear a black tunic and a black veil, which was to be blessed and bestowed on them by the bishop at the time of their consecration. They could live in their own homes, but they were not to leave the house without real necessity. The, pres the prescribed prayers were to be recited, alone or in a group, at the traditional hours of nine o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, and at 3 in the afternoon. In addition to this, they were to rise during the night to chant psalms. At Jerusalem, both men and women celibates usually joined the clergy for prayer at the prescribed hours. In the 4th century at Rome, Marcella and Asella welcomed the virgins and widows into their home for prayer and spiritual reading. The regulation on fasting was severe, and it lasted throughout the entire year, exceptions being made for health reasons of health. One meal a day was permitted, and only after three o'clock in the afternoon. It consists of bread and vegetables, and was preceded and followed by appropriate prayers. As regards the work of mercy, the virgins were encouraged to share their simple fare with the poor 
to visit the sick and to perform any works of mercy befitting their state of life. Both in the East and in the West the practice of cohabitation was introduced for a time. Clerics, or celibate men, shared the homes of the virgins to protect them and to provide for their spiritual needs. Inevitably, this situation led to abuses that were sharply criticized by bishops and preachers, such as St. John Chrysostom, St. Jero Jerome, and the Pseudo-Clement, author of the treatise Ad Virgines, composed in the middle of the 3rd century. Ultimately, ecclesiastical legislation was drawn up for the protection of the virtue of the consecrated virgins and to guarantee that they would be faithful to their commitment. These regulations contributed in no small measure to the development of truly monastic communities of consecrated virgins and the recognition by the Church of the religious life as a distinct state of life. It should be noted, however, that the vocation to married life among the early Christians was not only the normal calling, but that Christian matrimony and family life were a forceful witness to the teachings of Christ. St. Paul not only offered advice to husbands and wives and their children, but he used the union of husband and wife as a symbol of Christ's union with the church. In fact, the ceremony of the consecrated consecration of virgins was itself based on the marriage rite. The veiling of the virgin, taken from the Roman wedding custom, was a symbol of her marriage with Christ, and in the Middle Ages it was customary to give the consecrated virgin a ring and a crown, which were also marriage symbols. The celibate life and separation from the world did not connote a disdain for marriage or a Manichaean condemnation of created things. Eremitical and Cenobital Life The variety of opinions persists through the centuries concerning the sources of Christian monasticism. The following non-Christian types of monastic life have been proposed at one time or another as the inspiration and model of Christian monasticism. The recluses of Serapis in Egypt, the ascetical life of the Buddhists, the Essenians who dwelt as monks near the Red Sea, the Jewish ascetics called Therapeutae who lived near Alexandria, the Gnostics of Neoplatonism, the asceticism of the religion of Mithra. Ficker, who is an authority on this question, draws the following conclusion. Note that, regardless of the error on which Eusebius and Cassian rest a good part of their theories, it is indeed exact that monasticism was inspired from its beginnings, not exclusively, but truly, by a desire to imitate the apostles and the first Christians. Certainly there are elements of monasticism which are not specifically Christian, but common to every effort for interior perfection. This general basis of human spirituality explains the existence of real analogies between the monastic institution and institutions far from it, both in time and space. Nevertheless, the most fundamental Christian factor which historians have discovered in the history of monasticism is a powerful nostalgia for the early church. The principal expression of this was the wish to take up the apostolic life, that is to say, the Christian mentality communicated by the apostles to the early church and lived by them. This is not surprising if it is remembered that the early monks were convinced of the universality of the formula for the, of the Christian life described in the Acts. 
Dom Germain Morin substantiates the foregoing statement when he says that what was new at the beginning of the fourth century was not the monastic type of life, but the adaptation to the world by many Christians when the persecutions ended. Actually, the monks and hermits did nothing but try to preserve intact the ideal of the Christian life as lived from the beginning. St. John Chrysostom asserted that monasteries were necessary because the world it was not Christian. Let it be converted, and the needs for monastic separation will disappear. Indeed, St. John Chrysostom presents an interesting paradox in the last half of the fourth century. An ascetic, by temperament and by practice, and always a lover of the contemplative life, he nevertheless dedicated all his energies to the active life as a preacher and a director of souls. In his younger days he had spent four years in the Cenobitic life and two years as a hermit, but he seems to have practiced such harsh austerities that his health was endangered, and he had to return to Antioch. There he devoted himself to ministry, first as a deacon, then as a priest, and finally as the Bishop of Constantinople. Among his earliest writings were three treatises in, de in defense of the monastic life which contribute nothing to the theology of Christian monasticism. Boyer refers to them as an asceticism without a mysticism. His treatise on the priesthood, however, written while he was still a, a deacon, indicate St. John's awareness of a spirituality that is truly sacerdotal and not man monastic. He later extends his efforts to the promotion of the spirituality of the laity. He insisted that their basic spiritual exercises should consist in reading and meditating on scripture and the worthy reception of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. Perfection, said St. John Chrysostom, is the vocation not only of monks, but also of Christians in the world. Monasticism in the East was of two types, the eremitical life of hermits and anchorites and the cenobitic life of monks. The model of the eremitical life was Anthony of Egypt, who retired to a solitary life at the age of 20 and died in 356 at the age of 105. The Life of St. Anthony, written by St. Athanasius in 357, is the most important source of information on the eremitical life. Another helpful docket, document is the Apophthigmata Patrum or sayings of illustrious hermits. Finally, as representative of a later and more structured monastic life, we should mention the Historia Monacorum in Egyptio, which describes the life of the monks at the end of the 4th century, and the Historia Lausiaca, written by Pallidus, died in 431, to describe the monastic life in Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and Asia Minor. As recorded by St. Athanasius, St. Anthony taught that meditation on the last thing strengthens the soul against one's passion and against the devil. If Christians could live each day as if they were to die that day, they would never sin. In the struggle across the devil's wiles, the unfailing weapons are faith, prayer, fasting, and the sign of the cross. Since the hermit carries with him into solitude his own imperfections and evil tendencies, and since the devil seems to attack the hermit with special ferocity, the life of a solitary is essentially a warfare and a struggle. An individual may flee from the world, but 
in the desert he will be brought face to face with his own sinfulness and the devil who goes about seeking who he can devour. 1 Peter 5.8 Another important lesson taught by St. Anthony is that the hermit seeks both interior and exterior solitude in order to give himself completely to God. Consequently, he cannot allow any created thing to occupy his heart, because he because only he who has practiced total detachment can experience the full force of charity. But lest the hermit fall a victim to pride and self-love, he must, as a disciple of Christ, practice love of neighbor. He can do this by immolating himself for the salvation of souls, by his prayers for others, and by supporting them in the faith through his spiritual counseling. Indeed, according to St. Anthony, the solitary must be willing to leave his desert when the good of the church or the good of the souls require it. A number of disciples were attracted to St. Anthony by his austere manner of life and they frequently sought his advice. Gradually the eremitical life spread to other places. St. Amon died in 350, who had lived as a celibate with his wife, retired with her to the Nitrian Valley and founded a monastic colony. There was no common rule, and each solitary occupied himself as he saw fit, although they all gathered together on Saturdays and Sundays for litur liturgy and homily in the church. According to Palladius, there was at one time approximately 5,000 herbits in the valley of Nitria. To the south, in the desert of Skeet, Macarius of Egypt died in 390, and his disciples led an even more solitary life. Meanwhile, Macarius of Alexandria died 394. Settled with his flowers in the desert of Celia, Evagrius Ponticus also joined the colony and remained there until his death in 399. The austerities practiced by these solitaries were incredibly severe, and some of them would today be branded as masochistic. Palladius, the author of Historia Lausiaca, he also describes many of the prodigies and marvels performed by the ancient hermits, but even in doing so he stated that he feared that nobody would believe some of them. For example, that Macarius of Alexandria spent an entire season of Lent on his feet, day and night, during that time subsisted on nothing but cabbage leaves. The Anchorites of Egypt seem to have had a great influence on those of Syria, but there are solitaries, but the solitaries became eccentric to the extreme. Rejecting any kind of discipline, they preferred to lead a nomadic existence in wild and desert places. They refused to do any manual labor because they were committed to a life of perpetual prayer. In Palestine, on the other hand, the ascetics observed greater stability, attaching themselves to the holy places in order to be protected and to carry on divine worship. By the fourth century, numerous pilgrims joined their ranks, and among their visitors were St. Jerome, St. Paula, and John Cassian. At the same time that the eremitical life was flourishing in Egypt, Another form of monastic life, the Cenobitic, were, was introduced by St. Pacomius, who was born at Esna, near Thebes. In 318, after having served in the army and then having lived for some time under the guidance of the monk Palamon, Pacomius settled on the eastern bank of the Nile, just north of Thebes. 
The gradual development of the Cenobitic life took place as other ascetics joined Pacomius. He regarded this style of life as superior to that of a simple solitary. The life of a Cenobite is much more perfect than that of the Anchorite. By reason of the virtues which daily association with the brethren obliges one to practice, Moreover, the brethren are inspired by seeing the labors in the virtue of others. Those who are imperfect enable us to practice mortification, and those who are perfect show us the path we should follow. When the number of monks reached one hundred, Pacomius constructed a second monastery, some distance from Thebes, and within a few years there were nine such monasteries. Each monastery was like a little town, consisting of several buildings, each housing about forty monks, and the entire complex surrounded by a wall. St. Pacomius also founded a monastery of nuns at the request of his sister, and he located it near the men's monastery, but separated by a swift-flowing river which no monk was allowed to cross, except the priest who celebrated the liturgy for the nuns. The rule composed by St. Pacomius consisted of 192 regulations that reveal the prudence and moderation of the legislator. Each monastery was governed by an abbot or an archimandrite whom the monks were to give complete obedience. Various monks were named as officials in lesser categories, such as infirmarian, hebdomandarian, bursar, etc. The meals and prayers were community exercises, and each monk contributed to the earnings of the common fund. Unfortunately, some of the monks saw only the material advantages to the common life, but refused to obey Pacomius in other matters. His patience served only to encourage them in their egoism and disobedience. Finally, Pacomius took a stand. The monks either must either obey according to the rule or leave the monastery. Now, when you are called to the Synaxis, you will all come, and you will not act towards me as you have done. Likewise, when you are called to meals, you will come together and not behave as if you had been doing. If you are still inclined to disobey the instructions I have given you, you may go wherever you please. The earth is the Lord's, with all that's in it. And if you want to go somewhere else, do as you will. Uh, so far I am concerned I will not keep you here any longer unless you conform to the instructions I have given you. For Pacomius, obedience was the very foundation of the Cenobitic life, obedience to the rule and to the superior. At the same time he was willing to make adaptations so that all the monks could feel that they were living up to the commitment to the monastic life. Thus Pacomius stated, don't you know that certain brethren, especially the younger ones, have need of relaxation and rest? On another occasion he commanded, Provide an abundance at table, so that each one may deny himself and grow in virtue in the measure of his fervor. In, each, in other words, each monk was permitted to eat as much as his health or work required, and the manual labor assigned to the individual was in proportion to his strength. The monastic observances, prescribed by the rule of St. Pacomius, were adopted by the Lauras of Palestine, founded by St. Hilarion and perfected by St. Theodosius. In fact, many of the customs later observed by the monastic and mendicant orders of the West had their origins in the Pacomian monasteries. Thus, Pacomius insisted on a period of postulancy 
and novitiate before a candidate could definitely admit it to the monastic life. There was a vestition ceremony at the beginning of the novitiate, at which time the postulant was clothed in the habit of a monk, consisting of a linen tunic, a cowl, and a cloak made of goat skin. Admission to the novitiate was contingent on the favorable vote of the professed monks, and after a successful novitiate, dedicated largely to manual labor, formation in obedience, and the mesmerizing of the lengthy portions of scripture, the young monk made his vow to live according to the rule. In the Pacomian monasteries, the superior gave spiritual conferences to the community several times a week. The monks assisted at the liturgy and received the Eucharist on Saturdays and Sundays in a nearby church, if none of the monks were priests. Manual tasks were assigned each morning by the superior of the monastery, and silence was strictly observed, especially at meals. Fasting was prescribed on Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the year, and on those days only one meal was eaten, but in Lent every day was a fast day. The monks abstained totally from meat and wine and never took food outside of meal time. They wore their cowls while they ate. They slept fully clothed, not in a bed, but on a reclining chair, and the doors of their cells were always open. By the time St. Pacomius died in 346, a large number of monastic communities were flourishing in Egypt. However, it was in Asia Minor, under the leadership of St. Ba Basil, died 379, that monasticism took a new turn from a popular ascetical form of life available to all. It was to become a school of learned spirituality, wholly permeated with the heritage of Alexandria and above all of origin. As a result of this contributions to the theology and structure of the Cenobitic life, St. Basil is commonly hailed as the father of monasticism in the East, at least of mon monasticism of a well-defined way of life or of particular vocation. Born in 330, Basil studied at Caesarea, Constantinople, and Athens. At Caesarea he met Gregory Nan Nazianzen, and the two became fast friends. Both of them came into contact with the pagan Gnosticism of the Greeks and the Arian heresy. Later, Gregory Nazianzen and Gregory of Nyssa, the b brother of Basil, defended the transcendence of God and the divinity of Christ against the Arians. They also incorporated Orthodox Christian Gnosticism into monastic spirituality. While still young, Basil felt called to the ascetical life. He traveled to Egypt, Syria, and Mesopotamia, where he followed the monastic style of life for a time. Then, returning to his homeland, he distributed all his possessions to the poor and lived as a solitary until he was named bishop in 370. Although he gained great renown as an anchorite, St. Basil never considered the monastic life as exceptional or as special vocation. He even avoided using the term monk and referred to hermits and monks simply as Christians. For St. Basil, and for some time the other fathers, the monastic life was the logical consequence of the commitment made by the Christian at baptism. The fact that the monastic life was held up to the ordinary faithful as the ideal demonstrates that these early centuries was the only one spirituality for all Christians. The authentic Vita Apostolica 
and it was constituted by the perfection of the Christian life. Yet this very assistance on the monastic life, and indeed the contemplative life, as the perfection of the Christian life gave rise to further questions, are there, after all, two classes of Christians, the perfect and the ordinary? If monasticism is the ideal, are married Christians excluded from the possibility of attaining Christian perfection? Or are there two kinds of perfection, one ordinary and the other extraordinary? These questions have been posed again and again throughout the history of the Christian spirituality. St. Basil, however, did not look favorably on the strictly eremitical life, nor on total separation from human society. When asked whether a monk formed in the Cenobitic life could retire to the desert, he replied, This is nothing but a mark of self-will, and remains foreign to those who honor God. In his defense of the common life of Cenobites, Basil based his argument on the precept of charity. Who does not know, indeed, that man is a gentle and sociable being, and not solitary or savage? Nothing is as proper to our nature as enter into another society to have need of one another, and to love the man who is of our race. After having given us these seeds which he has cast into our hearts, the Lord came to claim their fruits and say, I give you a new commandment, to love one another. What did he say to them? All will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for another. Everywhere he unites these precepts, to such an extent that he refers to himself, the good deeds which our neighbor is the object. Everything that you did to the least of my brethren, you did to me. And so, by means of the first precept, it is possible to observe the second, and by the second go back to the first. My commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. St. Basil was not in favor of large communities. He preferred that they be small so that the common life could foster the recollection of the monks, and the superiors could relate to the monks, and the monks to each other, on a more personal level. The daily schedule for the community prayer, the study of sacred doctrine, especially of the works of origin, manual labor, mitigated asceticism and an apostolate that was incomparable with monastic life. The rule composed by St. Basil became the standard legislation for monasticism in the East, and it had a great influence on the monks as well. Perfect.